Welcome to The Plant Report, a radio show that educates about the green world one plant at a time. The Plant Report is a new educational resource about plants, herbal medicine, ethnobotany, and the human-plant relationship. Listen to our podcast, read our blog, watch our videos, and learn from experts and the plants. The Plant Report is a project of Sustainable World Radio and is hosted by Jill Cloutier. Thanks for listening to The Plant Report because every plant has a story. Hello, everyone. It's been quite some time since I posted a new Plant Report episode. And I create this podcast in my spare time, and lately I haven't had much of it. But my love for plants continues to grow, and I'm thrilled to offer you some new episodes that I hope you enjoy. If you'd like to hear more interviews about plants, fungi, permaculture, nature, seaweed, gardening, the list goes on, you can subscribe to my other podcast, Sustainable World Radio. And until our next episode, I hope that you are happy, well, and that you get to hang out with some of your favorite plants. Our plant today is fig, and our guest is Dr. Lee Reich. Lee is a writer, horticultural consultant, and educator with graduate degrees in soil science and horticulture. A former plant and soil researcher for the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Cornell University, Lee's books include Weedless Gardening, Uncommon Fruits for Every Garden, and Growing Figs in Cold Climates. And Lee wrote a syndicated gardening column for the Associated Press for nearly 30 years. Lee's Farmden, which is his term for his more than a garden, less than a farm piece of land, has been featured in many publications from the New York Times to Martha Stewart Living. And Lee's Farmden has won awards from National Gardening and Organic Gardening Magazines. And welcome to The Plant Report, Lee. Great to be here once again. Yes, it's wonderful. And Lee was a guest on Sustainable World Radio, my other podcast, where we talked a lot about soil health and how to garden like nature. So if you want to hear more from Lee, you can um, head over to SustainableWorldRadio.com and take a listen to that podcast. But for today, for the Plant Report, we are going to be talking about figs. And Lee, you're known as the uncommon fruit expert. And today, though, we're going to be chatting about a fairly common but very special plant, figs. And I think the first plant that you ever owned was a fig. And can you tell us about the fig that you shared an apartment with in grad school? (laughs) And yeah, tell us a bit about that. And did that plant start your career with um, plants? Well, that plant did not start my career. Actually, I was in graduate school in chemistry. I had dropped out for a year, started reading about gardening, and then decided I really want to learn about gardening. Well, so I enrolled in graduate school, in, uh, and I actually had a good uh, deal. With, uh, I actually was paid in the research. So I uh, dove into gardening and soils, and then I uh, really became very interested in growing plants besides just learning about them academically. So I don't know, for some reason... I don't know why. Uh, oh, I should stop right there and tell you. I was living in Madison, Wisconsin. In Madison, Wisconsin, temperatures typically drop without fail for quite a while in winter to minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is not a place where you'd think uh, somebody uh, who knew anything about plants, which I didn't at the time, would. Uh, but I knew that uh, figs were not could not be planted outdoors then. So I bought a little fig plant. And I uh, planted it in a pot, and that was my first uh, plant that I grew. Ah, the first of many. So we're all on the same page. Can you tell us the Latin name of figs? Ficus carica. Okay. And, you know, figs are one of the oldest, most ancient fruits, right, consumed by humans. And they have a super long history filled with folklore. And they're featured in many origin stories around the world. And they're also deemed sacred in many religions. And can you share with listeners some of your um, favorite stories about figs from ancient history? or? Well, my favorite one is uh, the story of Adam and Eve. And then after they uh, tasted the, the apple and uh, they became 
very uh, shy and decided they had to clothe themselves. So they uh, used fig leaves for clothes. And actually, there's a good quote that I have in my book. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. <laughs> that could be a look now. <laughs> <laughs> and figs are also deemed sacred in Buddhism. There was a sacred Bodhi tree, the tree of enlightenment. So it really across the board, figs are seen as a sacred special plant. I think Sumerian stone tablets dating to 2500 B.C., showed the culinary use of figs, and there's been Neolithic sites from 5000 BC held remains of fig leaves or fig trees. So this is really a, a plant that we've been cohabitating with for quite some time. Yeah, it's, it has such a, and I always, when I, you know, I often stop and think, why am I so crazed about figs? So I'm, I haven't lost the craze. I'm more crazed about figs now than I was then. And I know more about growing figs, and I grow them better than I did when I just started out. I never got a fig from that plant in Madison. Hmm. Uh, you know, it was too shaded, a lot of reasons. But uh, so I always wonder, you know, why why am I so crazy about figs? And then, you know, speaking to other gardeners, it seems like a lot of people where you shouldn't, you wouldn't think that people would grow figs because it's not like the hot dry mid-east climate you think why why is everyone so crazed about figs and you know one reason is i think maybe it's in our dna because it's such an ancient fruit it's been associated with humans for thousands of years so that's that's one reason and uh i guess another reason is, you know a lot of people whose whose roots are in the mediterranean region mm -hmm. when they came to new places they wanted to have some remembrance of home so they brought various things with them among them fig cuttings and figs are very easy to root from cuttings and then the the, the main reason is because they taste really good oh my uh, fresh gosh fruit. in california i know you you probably they probably like uh you know they probably drop their fruit and people just walk by them but when you grow them in northern climates pretty much before i got really good at growing figs i would you know when i shared a fig we would split it at least two ways or more just because they were so uh, cherished. Mm. But now I have tons of them. Oh, oh my gosh. Um, it, they, they're like ambrosia to me. Yeah. Like opening yeah. a fig, it's so beautiful, and the flavor is so unusual and delicious. So we're going to chat a bit about where figs are native to, how to grow them. And then I really want to hear, because you're growing figs in cold climates and actually wrote a book about this. I was really surprised to learn that you can grow figs in cold climates. Oh, yeah. It's, it's amazing because especially since the book came out and I've spoken to a lot of people that grow even more people than in the past. But it's amazing how many people grow figs. It's not it's not that uncommon. Well, where is the fig native to? I think it's a true Mediterranean climate plant. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's native to the Mideast. They say that uh, possibly, you know, probably it was first cultivated in southern Arabia. Um, so, you know, that that's close enough you know somewhere around there or exactly there is where it originated or that where it was first cultivated but originated in that that part of the world you know with hot dry climates and cool moist winters mm -hmm. so what family is the fig um part of it's in the moraceae family which is the mulberry family it includes mulberry fig osage orange which is a very unusual plant che is another very unusual fruit plant <laughs> Wow, what's che? It, che is, uh, it, well, botanically, it's Cudrania tricuspidata. And to me, the fruit has a very weird look. It's a, a, a small red, not small, you know, depending on where it's grown and how it's grown. It's roundish and red, but has all this sort of, uh, um, you know, design on, the, on its outside. And to me, it tastes like uh, a cross between a, a watermelon and a fig, or maybe a fig and a mulberry. Wow. Oh, I'm going to look it up. I have, I have to say that that also is not totally hearty here. So I grew it once, and it really uh, didn't taste that good to me. But I know other people, actually even around here, I found out, have grown it in better sites, and they said it's it's very good. For listeners who don't know where you're located, can you um, tell us where you are in the world? Oh, yeah. So I'm in New York's Hudson Valley, or New York's beautiful Hudson Valley. 
And uh, here the uh, winter temperatures used to drop reliably to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. But for instance, last winter was mild and it only got a little below zero degrees Fahrenheit. But the summers are hot. So uh, that that's good for figs, hot yeah. summers. And uh, I happen to be in a, a cold spot because I'm in a valley. Uh, not the Hudson River Valley isn't really a valley. I don't know why it's called that, but um, I'm in a valley of a small river called the Wallkill River. So I'm in the Wallkill River Valley, <clears throat> and it's unfortunately a very poor site for fruit growing. And fruit is one of my favorite things to grow generally. And you wrote your book, Uncommon Fruits. And I think I told you in our last interview that when I mentioned that I was interviewing you, pretty much nine out of 10 people said the uncommon fruit guru. <laughs> <laughs> so your reputation. I, I probably mentioned this before, mm -hmm. but uh, that book is now out of print, but I'm actually working on a, a updating and, and expanding it, and it should be back in print probably in two or three years. Oh, that's great. Two, Something years, to... if I, two years if I work hard this winter, three mm -hmm. if I don't. <laughs> work hardly. <laughs> uh, work harder. Yeah. <laughs> work well. Um, so... How long do fig can fig trees live, and how large do they usually get? Well, I know I was traveling in Israel a couple of years ago, and they'll get as big as you know a maple tree, mm. and, uh, I've, which I've seen them uh, that big in California, up up by uh, in Davis, California. So not not as big as a big maple tree. Say maybe it was probably you know thirty feet high. Or maybe bigger. and I th and I think they they can live for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. I read in some places a hundred years. Yeah, you know, one thing when you read about figs, because you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the sacred fig trees, and uh, fig is the is not only applied to the fruit; it's the fruiting ficus species, but there's other species also. And for instance, there's a plant called the weeping fig, also known as the banyan tree, which is ficus benjamina. And that's the one that Buddha sat under. It's, so it's not edible, but but as far as living hundreds of years, yeah, maybe. Well, a fig might live hundreds of years because it um it sort of it has a lot of bush like it, li it likes to grow like a bush, a large bush or a small tree. And and the way bushes grow. Uh, they send up new sprouts from ground level. Mm -hmm. So the roots, even if the top dies down, maybe gets old and decrepit, the roots will stay alive and they'll just keep sending up new sprouts. So I could see a fig living, you know, decades and decades and decades. Wow, that's amazing. And I believe figs are deciduous. Right. right? That's, an, that's an important point for us northern growers or cold climate growers. Because, uh, well... In winter, you have to do something to protect. Obviously, I can't, there's no way I do grow figs, but there's no way I just plant it in the ground and uh, leave it and then come back you know, in next next spring and it's going to be alive. It will sprout from the roots because in the ground, the temperature is much warmer than in the air if it's you know zero or below or any temperature because the ground a few feet down is never below about 50 degrees, even here. So uh, so you have to do something to protect it for winter. And uh, a lot of the things you can you do um, exclude light. So that's nice that since it's deciduous, you don't have to make sure it still has light and, le and the leaves are there uh, to get the light. So it drops its leaves. So all you got to do is deal with the stems, hmm. not the stems. So it makes it easier, I bet, bringing it inside and out. And we'll go more in depth on that in just yeah. a bit. Yeah, yeah. like if you're going to bring a lot of people grow them in pots, which we can get into. But uh, <clears throat> when you bring it inside, uh, a lot of people think, well, there's a tropical plant and they bring it inside to a warm room and they put it by a sunny window. That's actually, it's not only is it not necessary, it's not the best thing for the fig either. It does much better. Let it go totally dormant, let it drop its leaves and then put it somewhere, do something with it where uh, light is, need not be a factor. I mean, light mm -hmm. won't hurt it, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have leaves, so it doesn't really need it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's really a fascinating plant. It is. And so do you know about how many varieties of figs there are, the edible figs? 
Yeah, that would be hard to say. I have uh, this monograph on figs written by Ira Condit, which who was with the University of California for for decades. Uh, he died at the age of hundred, I think, in the nineteen fifties, and um, and he wrote this thing trying to catalog. And somebody had done that previously too, all the different varieties. And it's very hard. To, you're not getting a straight answer. I realize, <laughs> but uh, it, it's very hard to categorize it because so many figs have so many names, alter, alternative names, and so many figs are misnamed. So uh, I mean, what he had in the, in that book. I mean, I guess it was uh, just off the top of my head, thinking back, remembering the book. I mean, it's probably 100 varieties, maybe 75 to 100 varieties. But, you know, but he has like with a name, say like the ter the name brown turkey, which is a common fig. So the brown turkey is also called uh, magnolia fig sometimes. Sometimes it's called Lee's Perpetual. That's a good one. <laughs> but then also, there's a, also there's another fig so that's Eastern brown turkey. There's a fig that grows in California that's also a brown turkey, but it's a totally different fig. And that also has aliases. So it's really hard to keep straight. And then, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, say if, if uh, you, you know, somebody's grandfather came from Italy and uh, and he, when he came, he took a stem of a fig and stuck it in the ground and he didn't know what variety it was. But then maybe somebody nowadays they see it and they say, oh, that's a nice looking fig. And maybe they can't identify it as what variety it is. So they make up a name. Like I have a fig uh, that was a friend of mine uh, was helping some Hasidic Jews in New York City dig up this fig because there was going to be some work done somewhere. So he took some cuttings of it. And of course, nobody knew what the real name for this fig was. And then uh, he gave it to this farm nearby that I knew the farmer and then he gave me a cutting but they had given it a name because they didn't know what to call it and they called it Rabbi Samuel since it was the big Jews so so you know that's what it's called and I've actually tried to have it identified by um, various fig experts and nobody's been able to identify yet and it is possible because especially in in climates like uh, Mediterranean climates figs certain varieties of fig make viable seeds mm -hmm. and then if a seedling comes up it could become you know a fig that tastes good and if it does somebody will start propagating it and then it won't have a name and somebody will have to name it so it's kind of like endless right. <laughs> endless varieties of figs yeah. and they're <laughs> they're kind of undercover some of them yeah well i had i had some that uh, that i got from a nursery a uh, one number, and it turned out to be misnamed. And I think I did identify what the correct name was. Well, how many um, types of figs do you grow on at your farm, then? Uh, this, uh, you know, I used to live in southern Delaware. At that time, uh, I was amassing a collection of figs, and I, uh, through the government and other sources, I think I collected 35 varieties of figs. Wow. And then, then I moved to Maryland when I was in graduate school and I moved all those plants. You know, they were small, but then they got big in Maryland. <clears throat> and then I when I worked for Cornell, I was going to move to New York where I knew it was a lot more fig unfriendly climate. <laughs> and uh, I decided this would be insane for me to take all these plants. You know, it's just, you know, I do I do grow other plants besides figs. You know, I bet those, <laughs> fruits, some flowers. You know, so um, lawn. <laughs> uh, so, so I decided to take, I think, maybe it was like two or three varieties. So that I had two or three varieties. Um, and then uh, over the years, I don't know, they've just like, uh, like, you know, I get one here, I get one there. And uh, so now I have the ones that I've really fruited heavily. I only have four, but especially since I wrote the book, I wanted to test more varieties. So now I'm back to a, like a, 20 or so that's a lot it is a lot well i'm gonna get rid of some if they did. like one that was really uh touted as being everybody thinks it's the best tasting fig maybe just for northern growers or co-climate growers but um i happen not to like it so i'm gonna get rid of that and anything that doesn't taste like totally great i'm getting rid of you have high stand. You well, you are the uncommon fruit man, so you have high. <laughs> it's like, sorry, you don't make the cut. Goodbye. <laughs> right. Yeah, I gotta be this.
In doing research for this episode, I was really surprised by how unique they are in the fruit world. And so can we chat a bit about what makes the figs so unusual? So one thing is the flowers. Can you yeah, t- I, tell I, us I, I about can, this? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I was always been fascinated by that since I first learned about figs. And, and early on, even when I started graduate school mm-hmm. and had grown my first fig so poorly, I was like very interested in uh, in in just the botany of it and all that. And uh, so, so a fig is not a fruit, actually. It's called a synconium, which is if you took a piece of stem grow, and a stem grew in the shape of a fig, and on the inside of that stem, you put the flowers. That's a synconium, and that's what a fig is. And then uh, you might wonder, so how, do, how does it get pollinated? So the flowers are inside. So first of all, most of the flowers that, uh, most of the fig varieties that are grown in colder climates and actually most of the fig varieties that are around that exist or do not need any pollination which is another plus for figs they don't need to be pollinated and then but there is a, a one category there's three categories of figs there's common figs which is most of them and that's the kind that that uh we grow i grow and a lot of people grow and then there's a, another one called the smyrna type figs and these actually do need pollination and it's very interesting how they get pollinated because they have these special orchards of capra figs, which are not edible, but inside the capra fig, they're male flowers. And there's a little wasp called the blastophagus. And the wasp emerges at certain times to find another fig to a female fig to go to lay its egg in at the base of the female flowers inside that fig. So, so in uh, Europe, for ages they've taken these capra figs and they bring them to the cultivated smyrna fig orchards and then the wasp comes out finds these smyrna figs uh, goes inside the eye of the fig and runs around trying to lay her eggs and when she's oh when she left the capra fig she picked up pollen and she runs around inside the smyrna fig she's depositing the the pollen on the female flowers Uh and uh and then the fig gets pollinated and ripens. The problem is, uh, well, for her, is that the female is very frustrated because the shape of the flowers in the Smyrna fig, Smyrna type figs, is such that she really can't uh, lay her eggs at the base. So she's just scurrying around, going crazy, and is not does not realize what she wants to happen. She can't lay her eggs, but the fig did get pollinated. So it's good for us, bad for her. Wait, so. There's a lot to unpack there <laughs> with what you just said. Okay, keep going, but then I have questions. And I was just going to say, there's another type of fig, the San Pedro type figs, which uh, the first crop, uh, oh, oh, now I'm forgetting. But anyway, there's two crops. Figs often can make two crops, an early crop and a late crop. And one of those two needs pollination and the other one doesn't. This is so interesting. Okay, so... So it's not a fruit, but it's a synconium, I think you said. So the stem kind right. of expands into a into the fruit that contains the flowers. So are the flowers actually, when we open up a fig, are we looking at the flowers? Well, in in the in the um, Smyrna type figs, I I guess the little fruits in in you know at the where the flowers were, and the other types of figs, um, the flowers are just you know once the it becomes a fruit, they're parts in a carpet. So they don't need pollination in the common type <clears throat> and one of the uh, San Pedro uh, crops. So in the Smyrna type, you actually get a, a fruit as a result of pollination. And in the common type, you get a fruit that's not, the res- that doesn't have to be, that didn't have to be pollinated. But but the fruits, the fruits are little things at the base of the, uh, you know, inside the synconium, which is what most people consider the fruit. So really, we're eating fig synconiums instead of fig fruit. Right. Wow. And, if, and somebody, hands you, somebody hands you a fig, you can say, that's really a delicious synconium. Fig synconium. <laughs> and so we're eating part of the stem then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, how interesting. Well, it's not it's not that bad. Uh, in my uncommon fruit book, I talk about a, a fruit uh, or, yeah, it's a fruit plant called the raisin tree. Mm-hmm. And the raisin tree is a is a, has a 
fruit that's really just sort of like a dried out pea, but this fruit stalk swells into this sort of gnarly looking thing, almost looks like a, a walnut. Mm-hmm. And it tastes sort of like a walnut, and that's the edible part. There's a lot of weird things in the fruit world. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Okay, and then you mentioned <laughs> that some figs can bear two crops of fruit. And so that would come in handy as well, I would think. Right. Well, this is this is another reason that figs are really adapted to many different climates, including cold climates. Because <clears throat> most fruits, uh, for instance, like an apple or a peach tree, most common deciduous fruits, you know, like apple, pear, cherry, all those fruits, they bear fruit on on stems that are more than one year old. Like it might be a few years old, or the the it, they have to be at least one year old. Like a peach tree bears a one year old stems, an apple tree might be for a number of years old, but a fig tree is different in that it bears a new growing shoot. So you know if if a, if a shoot starts to grow, it actually bears fruit on that shoot that same season. So that's what's called the main crop of the fig. But some figs, not that many, can also bear um, a fruit on, if it has one-year-old growth, it can bear fruit on one-year-old growth. That'd be the early crop. And then the shoot starts, little buds start growing and shoots start growing. And that those then it starts ripening figs there later. And that's the main crop. I don't know if I said, did I say the first crop? Uh, so the fig on one-year-old stems, figs uh, with certain varieties will develop and ripen, and that's called a breba crop, B-R-E-B-A. And buds will grow from that stem, and new shoots will form, and that will those fruits will ripen later. That's the main crop. But the, the way this relates or makes it good for growing cold climates is if you, you don't have to have a giant tree. You can have a tree that you cut back to a certain, you know, relatively small and then if you can just keep that small amount of stem alive through winter one of many ways then new buds will grow and they'll send up shoots and it'll ripen fruit figs are a very accommodating plant right right and they're also they also tolerate a lot of abuse you know and this also relates to growing cold climates as far as you know having their roots hacked back having their stems bent down all sorts of things and I want to learn about that, too, in just a sec. But really quickly, is there a fig tree, would you say, for every zone then? Almost? Yeah, so if you went way, 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 way far north, you know, if you had a greenhouse, you could do it. But uh, it would be harder without a green. It would be probably not possible in way, you know, northern Canada or something like that. But, yes, there are figs. But it's mostly... Uh, there's a lot of figs for all sorts of climates, but it's a lot of it is technique, how you treat the fig. Okay. And you, I think you treat yours well because <laughs> it, sounds, <laughs> it sounds like you get a lot of figs from your trees. So yeah. on that note, before we dive um, into that in more depth on how you do take care of your figs, is there anything that I missed that makes um, figs so unusual that you want to share with listeners today? Well, I guess I alluded to the, the ones that we mostly grow do not need pollination. So that makes it good for growing. And also, uh, you know, I said that uh, people sometimes think, well, there's a tropical plant they put in a, in a warm, sunny room for winter if it's in a pot. And uh, figs actually do better with a little winter rest. So they, they it's good for them to lose their leaves and experience some colder temperatures. Hmm. Makes them resilient, and they probably need it to thrive. It sounds like, because the Mediterranean climate, right? You have the cooler right. winter, yeah. Yeah, and then they have a, it's a cycle. Then they get to fit into this cycle of growth, rather than maybe if 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 they didn't feel the winter, they'd you know they can grow in the tropics, but they probably sort of like just cough out a few branches, <clears throat> a few stems uh, now and then. And it's, it's not like you know they stop and then they really start growing. To make a fig tree happy, right? Um, it sounds like yeah. it prefers a hot, dry climate, at least in the summer. What What are its water needs and fertilizer and soil needs? Its uh, water needs is, uh, not to be too non-technical, but when it's thirsty, it needs water. <laughs> you, you don't want to wilt thing. And, and how much water depends on how you're growing it. Because, you know, I listed a number of ways of, 
uh, growing it in cold climates. And uh, each way will require watering on the part of the gardener or not. Soil, you know, just like any other plant, uh, moderately fertile. Uh, they don't need particularly fertile soil, but, uh, you know, moderately fertile soil that's well-drained. Drainage is important. You don't want water sitting on it, although they are somewhat tolerant. So you could grow figs on a lot of different soils. <laughs> the best way to fertilize is to look at plant growth. And if you, you, if you don't see healthy leaves and good growth from a plant, you need more nitrogen probably. But I tend to fertilize, as I might have mentioned in the last podcast, I, compost is one of my main fertilizers, even though it's technically or legally not a fertilizer because it's very low in nutrients, but it brings a lot of other good things to the soil and to plants. So I use uh, compost basically for everything. And if I'm growing in a pot, I make a potting mix, um, you know, out of various things that include compost. And basically I don't uh, go out of my way to fertilize them. Figs can, if you, a tendency, if you over fertilize figs, they can become too rampant in growth. So limiting fertilizer is not a bad thing. Hmm. Do you want to say a few words on uh, pruning and how that's key to having a healthy fig? As, as far as pruning the fig, first of all, fig responds to pruning just like all other plants. Whereas if you shorten a stem, you know, and there's various degrees you could shorten it, that uh, stimulates growth of buds beneath uh, in the parts of the stem that remain. So that's good if you want to stimulate growth locally. And if you remove a stem completely, that usually uh, just nothing happens there. So if you're growing a plant for for the uh, main crop, which you often are, uh, when you sh cut everything back to say uh, two feet, then that's shortening a stem and you're gonna next spring have, and this is dormant uh, while the plant is uh, dormant, you're gonna have new growth and that new growth is going to bear the main crop. And, but of course, the new growth has to start high enough in the on that stem in order to bear the main crop in time. And then if you want a braber crop too, you want to uh, leave some one-year-old stems because these are going to bear the braber fruit, uh, but also shorten some stems so you get, uh, you get the main crop also. Wow, it sounds like there's a lot to learn about figs. In the book, I have a, a diagrams. I think that it makes it much more clear. And it's, it's not hard. And so your book, Growing Figs in Cold Climates, really um, teaches people how to successfully grow this fruit um, in its non-Mediterranean climate. You mention um, different techniques on how to keep your plants healthy. And if you could go into detail about a few of them, I know greenhouse growing is one growing in a pot. So do you want to go over just briefly a few of the methods that you use? Yeah, I could talk about it briefly. I'd like to mention the greenhouse last because that's, I, I have a, I have a small green, a greenhouse and, uh, and it feels very luxurious to have a greenhouse in this climate. So I want to put that one last because a lot of people don't have greenhouse. The most common way is in a pot. And each of these, each of these techniques um, you know, have their downsides and, and upsides. Like growing in a pot is easy, but you have to be able to move the pot in winter to someplace, you know, where uh, it'll be protected from the winter cold. So I used to uh, move all mine down to my basement <clears throat> where the temperatures were like, say, 45 degrees in winter because it's not really heated the basement, which is really ideal, but carrying a pot down the narrow steps, I figured this is how I'm going to die. <laughs> God. But, uh, but, but you know, so, so, and also it limits the size of the pot. And the smaller the pot, the smaller the plant, and the smaller the plant, the less figs. So you, it limits that. And the other thing is um, in a pot, you have to pay more attention to watering and uh, fertility, you know, either through what the potting soil is or if the potting soil needs. May, my need supplemental fertilizer. Uh, I don't know if I have the story in my book, but when I lived in uh, Madison and I had my figs, so I had them outside in the summer and would get hot and they'd grow really well. But in midsummer, when they were really growing uh, vigorously, 
it, uh, they would need watering. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't leave my house for more than say uh, four or five hours because they would need watering. And this before I had, you know, even heard of drip irrigation or anything like that. This, this is a long time ago. And so, so I felt sort of like a dairy farmer who had to get milk as cows, you know, you couldn't leave, never can leave your property for more than a few hours. But uh, so, so that's one thing, you know, is really have to do watering. So now I do grow some potted figs and all my potted figs are in automatic watering through a drip irrigation system. And are they inside? They're outside. But then you bring them in. Oh, yeah. And, and so, yeah. Then I bring them in to the uh, basement. But mostly I bring them into now I have a walk-in cooler because I grow so many fruits and vegetables. So it's really nice. I can just load them onto a cart or into my truck and we drive right up to the cooler and, and slide them in there. And no steps. Right. <laughs> but I, still have to, I still have to be able to lift the pot. Although I know some people, I've seen people that, you know, they use a forklift, you know, on their tractor and they just put it right somewhere. So mine isn't that, that uh, good. Can't do that. Well, it must be so heavy. How tall are these trees? So you gear how you prune it also to how you grow it. So I like to grow the common type fig, and often I grow figs that are known for their main crop, not their braver crop, which means I don't have to save any one-year-old stems. So if I if I maintain a, a permanent trunk, it's very easy to prune, a permanent trunk of, uh, say, or maybe a few trunks of, say, uh, stems that are uh, maybe a couple of feet high, then growth from those stems will ripen figs. If you cut them back too low, then they ripen later and often not in time. So, uh, so you know, the thing's two feet high. And I guess the largest pot I ever had was probably, you know, 18 to 20 something inches across. But also in my potting mix, I use, uh, I make it a, a light potting mix, like with extra perlite, so it's not too heavy. And which I can do since I have the drip irrigation. If it does drain quickly, then so I have to water more frequently. But it's much lighter, right? But still, you know, something to do, you know, carrying it. So, um, and then uh, so that's that's one method, and, and I think the important thing is uh, winter storage and summer watering, especially. But it's very reliable, and a uh, uh, limitation is you know how much how many figs you get. Also, it can be really pretty. You know, I have a friend that has, uh, and I have a picture in the book. She has these uh, decorative pots, and she has these, and this is up in New York. And uh, she has these figs. Uh, you know, they're compact varieties, and they look really pretty, and they're bearing fruit. And you know, you can get like a good amount of fruit from it. Another way that that sort of overcomes some of the deficiencies is you plant it right out in the ground, even in climates like this. And every uh, fall, you dig it up. You you know, and you cut back the roots because the plants can take abuse. And then you drop it into a plastic bag and uh, a large plastic bag <laughs> and, and you tie it up uh, so the water doesn't get lost from the roots and you bring it down to the basement or wherever you're going to store it. And the nice thing about this one, you put it in the spring, you put it in the ground, you give it a good watering, and then the roots can expand as far as they want into the surrounding ground. So you don't have to bother about, uh, well, a few things. You don't have to bother watering it uh, once it get, the roots get established, which can happen fairly quickly. And also the fruit, the plant can get much bigger. So you can get a lot more fruit. You better lift weights so you can do all this lifting. <laughs> or no, just yeah, lift yeah. your fig trees. <laughs> so that's, and so one, one variation on that, which I liked, which I did, is I got a big, uh, maybe a, you know, 18 inch uh, plastic flower pot, plastic container. And I drilled holes in the side, a few holes about a half inch in diameter. And I would sink that into the ground and then with the fig in it. And then during the growing season, the roots would grow out of those holes. And then it's really easy to dig up. You just take a shovel and you slice off the roots where they're coming out of the holes, lift it up and it's in the pot, put it in the basement or, or the cooler or somewhere, you know, Cold and dark. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be dark. And the plant doesn't, does it go into shock and like, no? No. Because cutting the roots. No, it take, takes abuse. Mm -hmm. Remember? Abuse. <laughs> they like, uh, not they like, they tolerate. 
And then there's a few other ways you can, uh, if the climate isn't too, too cold. Here, it's really too cold for this, but uh, you can wrap the plant in, uh, if it's if it's just mildly cold, you can just wrap it in a blanket. If it's super cold, you can wrap it in insulation. And once again, you can tie the branches, you can cut them back just like uh, you would prune the other ones, but you don't have to cut it back as much. Uh, tie some uh, insulation around it or something, and then uh, put a cap on it, like an upside down uh, bucket or something, and then leave it exposed like that for winter. It's not the prettiest thing, I have to say, although, although possibly you could make it prettier and sort of like a sculpture. <laughs> or use a, a cute sculpture. jacket. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Well, I like that. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> You have to you have to make sure it zips up nicely. <laughs> With a hood. Jeez, um, I might have to try that just so I can get a picture of uh, the yeah. down jacket. As we water waterproof too. Oh, I like that. That was it. I put the yeah put the hood up instead of a cap. Wow, that's a great idea. I wonder if it would work. I'll copy, I'll, I'll copy that and attribute it to you. I'll finally get famous. Wow, was, uh, yes. For <laughs> I don't know if I could. I don't know if I could speak anymore. That was such a good idea. Oh my gosh! And, and then another method is a lot of people do is you can do it in almost any climate. You can bend the tree down, lay it on the ground, and cover it with you know as much mulch as you want. And that that's a good one because that oh, and the way you lay it down is you can chop the roots on one side because they like I mean tolerate abuse, and then uh, bend it down because the stems are somewhat flexible. And, and uh, lift it up in the spring, and and then you got to plant in the ground, so that can really you can get a lot of figs from that. When I lived in Wisconsin, actually, there was a, a Italian delicatessen. Um, were they called delicatessens? An Italian food store, and uh, and they had a trench that was like chest deep, and they would bend their fig tree. They had two fig trees there, and they'd bend it down into the trench hold it down and put these doors on top old doors and piled leaves on top of that and in the spring they and you know the ground is about 50 degrees three feet down so it's plenty warm down there and then uh in the spring they had a system of pulleys they'd lift it up and they used to get tons of figs so then the the tree stays in place almost but it's just bent over right well, I was thinking even better would be if, if you planted at say a forty-five degree angle, it'd be easier to bend, easier to bend down and easier to bend up. You don't have to go a half of twenty-two and a half degrees each way. <laughs> well, you, didn't you do? And I saw a picture, I think, on your blog of an outdoor fig horizontal espalier. espalier. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that. That's my my newest method. So this actually came from what I was doing in the greenhouse. So so the final method is using in a greenhouse or an unheated hoop house, and for that one. What I do is, um, you know, I used to just cut them back, you know, to the right height and everything, but then they just grow sort of wantonly uh, in the greenhouse. And it was hard to figure out like what, how much to cut back. And it was really sort of a mess. So I started espaying them. And if anybody doesn't know what espaye is, it's a training plant to sort of a very sort of rigid uh, um, system, which looks really pretty because the, because uh, it's pretty, First of all, it's productive. And secondly, the tracery of the stems is attractive. So in this one, uh, the first one I did was a, was a low T. If you picture the upright of the T is about uh, 12 or maybe a little more inches high. And then I have two permanent horizontal arms going in either direction, coming out from those uh, parallel to the wall. And then the fruiting shoots, which are the new shoots, uh, grow vertically from the tops to those two arms. And it's really easy to prune because every year I just cut all those uh, verticals back to those permanent arms. Then they, it, the thing goes dormant in the greenhouse because it's a it's a cool temperature greenhouse. It's uh, it's only heated if the temperature gets below about 35. And then, uh, and then next spring, it, it sends up these vertical shoots again. And then it's really nice because all along those vertical shoots, there's just figs. So I was thinking about that method of burying figs. And then I thought, uh, well, why don't I just train, a, rather than bend it down and bend it up, why don't I just train a low SBA right at or near ground level, or even a little below ground level. And then that'd be easy to cover and I could put leaves on top, you know, just keep it warm. 
and then uh, and new shoots will grow vertically and they'll ripen. So that's what I'm working on now. That's so cool. Yeah, it looked really cool in the picture. Yeah, well, it's going to look cooler in years to come. <laughs> <laughs> and you're actually using kind of the warmth of the of the ground, right? Yeah, to yeah. To keep it safe in the winter. Right. That's great. And then, okay, so figs, those are all really good steps. Is there anything you left out about if you want to grow figs in cold climates that we didn't talk about? Just a million details for each yeah. of those. Methods. <laughs> no. uh, okay. Which you can learn more about at leereich.com, which is L-E-E-R-E-I-C-H.com. And in your book as well. Yeah, and the thing is, I think that uh, what I would say is you can grow figs in cold climates. Uh, and a, a few things to keep in mind. First of all, if you've never tasted a dead ripe fresh fig, you're in for a real treat because it tastes totally different from a dried fig, which I also like dried figs. And actually, I had so many this year, I did dry some. But uh, but it's a really a taste treat. And some people think, well, you know, I can just buy them in the supermarket or, you know, at the farmer's market. But generally a fig, uh, is, it really, it's very uh, soft and perishable fruit and, and easily damaged. So it really should not travel more than about arm's length. You know, <laughs> you know. uh, and, and if you think, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'll just, uh, you know, get some, even if they're not ripe from the supermarket, I'll just let them sit till they ripen or or some people pick theirs before they're totally ripe and don't pick them under ripe because they do not ripen at all off the plant. And a lot of people think there's a lot of fruits that, you know, they'll just let them soften and ripen. So I, I always say that when people do that, that it's not really ripening. They will get sweeter as the starches break down to sugars um, sometimes because of uh, bacteria or something, but it's more like incipient rot. If you, ripen them that way it had, does not compare with the, a tree ripened uh, fruit okay that's good to know they're hyper local only as far as your arm <laughs> right i mean all you know like avocado has to ripen off a, a tree a pear has to ripe. uh european pears have to ripen off a tree but a lot of fruits that people think they can ripen on a, on a kitchen counter will not and fig is really a special one it's like so uh delicate in taste and 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 texture and and uh it, it really can't travel at all so do grow figs and you can grow figs in cold climates that's exciting news for a lot of people one thing too that i really love about figs is the propagation is quite easy from cuttings right right and that's one reason i think why there's so many names and misnames for figs because you know, people go along and they just like stick a plant in the ground stick a cutting in the ground and they'll root As a matter of fact uh i'm sure it's not true now but uh, traditionally in europe the way they would start fig orchards they just take two cuttings for insurance and stick stick them in the ground and figure that a tree's going to grow there and, and you know 90 percent of the time it does I guess it's a clone, right? So it would be right. the same fruit that you yeah. got. That yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, our neighbors who have probably twenty five fig trees, maybe oh, they wow. gave us stick. You know, sticks. Yeah. I had no clue. This is a few years ago, and they said, "Oh, just put them in the pot, and they should." And the little leaves came up at the bottom of the cutting. Yeah, a big leaf actually, and for it just sat there for a long time, and then all of a sudden, it's like, wait, this leaf at the surface of the ground, what is this? And it was the figs, so they oh. seem quite easy to propagate. And what happened to that fig, if I might ask? They're they're now probably two, two, three feet maybe, and they're growing. Yeah, and the other thing about figs, oh, I didn't even mention this, is they bear very quickly. Um, I've had figs, I took a cutting of a Kadota fig, which is one of my favorite varieties. Not that great for cold climates because it's a very long season, but I can do it in the greenhouse. And uh, I took a cutting and it rooted. And the next spring, it sent up a, sent up a shoot. And I have it, a picture of it in my book. It just has a fig at every leaf node. Wow. So that's super yeah. fast. Yeah, like, like I've had pear trees that took, you know, eight years before they start fruiting. Figs are eager to grow. That's great. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And eager to grow on fruit. Mm -hmm. Yes, fruit quickly. Okay, so, Lee, you are growing um, these delicious figs. What's your favorite way to prepare and eat them? 
And do you have a favorite recipe you'd like to share with people? So I'm generally uh, much better at growing fruits than, than doing anything except eating <laughs> fruits. And in some ways, I feel like it's a diss to do anything to a fruit, but just eat it plain. But I have had more figs sometimes than I can deal with. So I think of other things. So nothing uh, very uh, uh, innovative that I thought of, you know, any fancy dish or anything. But I know that they're good with uh, something like uh, goat cheese. And but my favorite thing with a fig is uh, I really like super dark chocolate. Super dark chocolate, it really balances that that sweetness of the fig. So super dark chocolate, you take a square about three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch, and you eat it at the exact same time as you get a fig that's not too big. If it's a big fig, get another square of chocolate. <laughs> that sounds really good. You could you could market that as Lee's Fig Bites. I, I, actually, I actually started doing that with um, with dried Smyrna figs. Mm. And I tried it with the, my fresh figs and it was really good. Yeah, I know. Fresh figs, really, for those who haven't tried them, it really is so delectable. They're wonderful. Yeah. And I, I should mention also to, to pick a, to make sure it's, it, it should be so much softer, though. Some figs are a little firmer when they're ripe. And often it has a little tear in its eye. Mm. So that's another indication it's ripe. And uh, it doesn't come off. You know, some fruits like apples and pears, you know, you, you lift and twist them. And if it breaks at the stem, uh, that's that means it's ready to pick. Uh, with figs, it's not always like that since it's a parthenocarpic fruit. It's not ripening a seed that all of a sudden says, okay, now I'm ripe. So, to, you know, it's, it's not an instant in time, but it's good. As I said, do not harvest before they're ripe. Mm -hmm. And they give a little bit too, right? A teeny bit softer? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, some of them a lot. Rabbi Sato gives a lot. And so <laughs> and so the when you pick a fig, there's a little bit of white sap or latex that comes out. And that can be yeah. an irritant, right? You don't really want to get that right. all over your yeah. lips. <laughs> yeah, people that um well, I think if you just eat one or two figs, I might never pay attention to it either way. Or if I don't eat the very end of the you know, the the very end of the fruit near the by the stem, which is where that, that sap would be in the fruit. There's not, none of that. <clears throat> but people who harvest figs commercially, they often wear gloves just because they're constantly getting the sap on them. Lee, in closing, um, we've learned a lot about figs today from you, and I'm curious if you have any favorite varieties you'd like to share with people. Well, I do have some favorites, which I'll mention, but I also, uh, next year when I get a lot of the newer varieties I got, uh, uh, new for me, not necessarily new varieties, uh, I'll have even more, but my favorites now from the ones I've tried are uh, Rabbi Samuel, which I mentioned, which I don't have no idea what the real name is. I like round turkey. It's not my favorite, but it's a very common, very reliable one. But then I have two others. I've uh, well, three others. I have uh, Kadoda, which is I, I love the texture and the flavor, and that one is grown in California a lot, and. Uh, Kadoda was, they actually were trying to breed in California and improve Kadoda, and they came up with a variety called Excel, which I also really like a lot. And then there's another one that I grow that's an older one. <clears throat> uh, it's called San Piero, uh, S A N P I E R O. Well, thank you so much, Lee, and I look yeah. forward to chatting with you again. Bye. Thanks for listening to The Plant Report. The Plant Report is produced by Jill Cloutier and is a project of Sustainable World Radio. For more podcasts about plants, permaculture, and ecology, visit our website, sustainableworldradio.com, and you can also find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. The Plant Report is created for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any health condition. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to thank the plants for everything they do.